Hey guys, welcome back. So Nansen just posted this article on Flare and I want to talk about it because uh, today I had a little experience with Stro Finance, which is being built on the EBM sidechain. And I don't want to shit talk about other projects. I like it. I mean, I just understand the limitations of what they're using. I want to talk about Flare from that perspective, not about my token is better than others. I hate that. I think it's just so dumb. So, uh, yeah, I supplied and I, I have some XRP there, which I'm going to leave. I want to support them because they seem like a good uh, team. Uh, I just got in contact with them on Discord. So this week we're going to have some conversations about it. But um, yeah, let's talk about Flare. And yes, of course, I own Flare. Flare has become like it's kind of between my first and second holdings depending on the day between xrp and flares but i also think that i support flare not because i have tokens but because i believe in what they're building and i understand that hype is very easy to do and real solutions take a while so flare network is a layer one blockchain that is designed to solve one of the uh, crypto's bigger challenges interoperability it allows sm non-smart contract tokens to be used and to interact and transact between them securely. It is using the innovative state connector. Flare brings off-chain and cross-chain data onto the blockchain in a decentralized, verifiable way. Uh, I'm going to talk more about it a little bit below. So what happens is that because you, can, you have the oracles on Flare that are built on the protocol level, like the oracles are not something that is built on top of Flare. It's part of how Flare is working then a lot of cross-chain DeFi, NFT, NFT interoperability and dApps that rely on real-time multi-chain verifiable data. So that means that because you can trust that data that the, the oracles on Flare are pushing, then you know that your value is exactly what it is because it reduces the, the risk of manipulation, of data manipulation. There are specialties connecting separate blockchains ecosystem that typically can communicate with each other. Think about as a universal translator that allows Bitcoin to talk to Ethereum or XRP or to interact with Dogecoin. So at some point, this is not f fully built. Like Flare is about to release their XRP bridge which I'm super excited about. But in the future, there's going to be Bitcoin, there's going to be Dogecoin. They're also talking about XLM, which uh, there's a few tokens from XLM that I would love to bring to Flare and put them to work as well. It's very unique. Uh, I've been checking out different projects that are coming out around XRP. And even though I think that they're good products, the more I learn about Flare, the more that I understand the limitations that they're working on. That's why Flare has taken so long to bring it, bring this because it doesn't exist. If it was easy, there would be 50 amazing products around the XRP. And to be real, like we're not there yet. So let's talk first about the state connector. This is an information highway. So imagine a witness that can securely bring off-chain information into the blockchain without relying on any centralized intermediaries. So you have 100 validators right now on Flare that are witnessing different events and those events can be programmed so that they are paying attention and then if they bring them correct the system rewards them if they bring bad data the system punish them so you can rely that if 100 validators are agreeing on some event happening that gives you so much more certain that certainty than you would with five validators or an exchange which most centralized exchanges they are known for manipulating data. So this is something that it's this is something that it solves. So what are the actual purposes for this? Imagine that you can capture data about transactions on other blockchains. So what if the hundred validators on Flare can verify that a transaction was sent on a Bitcoin network? Just picture that. And you know that that happened. Like you can't cheat. You can't manipulate that data. If that transaction happened, then the oracles will say so. And if it didn't happen, then the oracles will say that it didn't happen. It uses a Merkle tree cryptography to verify the information's authenticity. So how this works is that you imagine a tree and each tree has a piece of the puzzle. So if you need to verify some piece of information, the tree goes from the lower branch 
and that says, okay, this is okay. And then the next branch says, okay, this is also okay. And then it keeps going all the way to the top. So if you need to verify something, you just have to trace that path that goes upwards to the master uh, verifier. And then if all the pieces in that tree match, then you can verify data without needing to reveal the information of that data. And this is where it becomes very interesting. This is uh, similar to the zero proof. Like the system is a little bit different, but it uses the same where you can prove that something happened without knowing what is that that happened. It creates a decentralized bridge between separate blockchain ecosystems. So the current FXRP bridge, what happens is that you lock XRP on an escrow on the XRP ledger. And because the 100 validators of the, uh, with the state connector can verify that that operation happened, then when, somebody's mint, uh, when the agent is minting that FXRP on Flare, then you verify that the deposit happened and that it's locked. And then he verifies that it, it was minted. So now you have proof of those two events. And then the agent cannot redeem the, the XRP unless the 100 validators are telling him that he is free to do so. And the escrowed XRP on the XRP ledger cannot be released unless the 100 validators agree upon. So that reduces the, the, the risk because now you have a truly decentralized Oracle system and a, like an agreement system that has 100 validators. If they all agree, we do it. And if not, not. So this removes the point of failure because then it's not up to one single entity to decide what's going to happen. It has to happen in agreement with everybody. Allows developer to build asset bridging tools with enhanced security. At some point in the future with Flare 2.0, we're going to have the protocol managed wallets. And that means that when you send, when you want to bridge your XRP, your own Flare wallet is going to create an XRP account. And then that account, the only way that it can do something is with the whole Flare consensus, same thing. So that wallet is not in a centralized party, it's under your control, but you control it with Flare consensus. At some point, the, the same thing is going to happen with Bitcoin, with Dogecoin, with XLM. Imagine the power of that. It's, it's insane because now you could control every network from Flare using the 100 validators to verify that data. I think at the beginning, uh, Hugo said that at some point he would love to have a thousand validators. So imagine the decentralization, if a thousand validators need to agree to approve a bridge in or a bridge out. And then we have the Flare Time Series Oracle, the FTSO. So this guy is also part of the, it's embedded on the protocol level on Flare. That's what enshrined oracles means, that they're not something built on top. They're part of how the system works. And their job is to rely price data. So if there's a, a voting and then the FTSOs add a price, a price feed and they have certain rules and then they're witnessing those prices from many different places. When everybody agrees, that's the price that happens. So you can't manipulate the price feed with one or two validators because everybody has to agree. So this is what I was saying, the reduced manipulation risk. It incentivizes accuracy through the network tokens economy. So if you're accurate as a FTSO, then you get paid. If you're not accurate, you don't get paid. You as a user don't worry about that unless you're delegating to a provider that is not giving uh, good data, then you're missing out on your share of those rewards. Supports DApps development with reliable pre pricing data. So imagine a future a future platform or a perpetuals where you can rely that the data is good and not one of I, I remember with Hyperliquid, I think it was, that there was some like price manipulation to counter a, a hacker's attack. And in this case, I mean, I'm happy that they were able to do that. But you as a user realize that those platforms can manipulate the price. So as long as they're doing it to benefit everybody, that's okay. But what if they don't? Or what if a bad actor gets control of that network? Would you be happy if you got liquidated just because somebody's benefiting from that? I don't think so. And that enables complex financial applications on Flare. There, there will be more about this. I, there's not enough information for me to talk about it. So 
Flare is the token, the native token on Flare networks. So it has different functions. It's a governance token. So I remember at the beginning when the distribution, they put out the, the, the governance proposal and then people would be able to vote yes or no. Most people voted yes to the change in distribution. And I think that the people that are paying attention benefited greatly from that, me, myself included. It allows for validation. So it's a proof of stake. Flare is a proof of stake. So it, you either delegate your vote to the FTSO and you get some rewards or you stake. And then if you stake, you lock your tokens. We also have a liquid staking token, which is you stake with Scepter, which that's the, the, the provider, and then they stake with the validators and then they give you a receipt token. So that means that you can stake and participate securing the network, but at the same time remain power of your tokens. This is going to be very similar to what's going to happen with Firelight on FXRP. So it's important for you to understand this because it's going to be the same for FXRP. You're going to mint FXRP and then you're going to stake with Firelight. Firelight is going to stake that, that FXRP and then in return they're going to give you a, a staked XRP which you can go into a lending platf platform and put it as collateral to take a loan. You can enter LPs, you can enter futures, you can do whatever you want after that. So imagine you have a steady yield, which is I don't think is going to be in the double digits. The Hugo said between, I think, 4 and 8%, which is great. But then if you have that capital available to do something else, then that's even greater. The rewards. Uh, so if you are participating by wrapping and either delegating or staking your XRP, you get part, you get part of the uh, rewards. And then gas. Every single transaction on Flare uses Flare token to pay for gas. So once you bridge your XRP into Flare, if you want to loan your FXRP, you're going to pay gas on Flare. If you want to withdraw, you're going to pay gas. If you want to send your FXRP to your other account, you're going to pay Flare on gas. One of the big difference, and this is where I, I show the Strove uh, Finance thing, is that once you bridge, you pay that bridge fee and then you are on Flare. So the, the fast and cheap transactions of Flare, that doesn't, that's not going to change. Like you're going to always pay those fees. And then in Strove, what happened is that first, I supply XRP. I don't know if I can see the, the TX here. Yeah, okay, so here it is. So the first transaction, 5 XRP, I paid a quarter of XRP. And then when I supplied, yeah, that was, that was the same, so it's going to be the same price. And then when I borrowed, here I, I it says that I paid 0 0.001 XRP, which that's fine, but you will see that I only receive 149.27. So I paid 70 cents to borrow USDC. And then I supplied again. So then in that case, so here, what happened is that I withdraw, I borrow the USDC and I got it on XRP Ledger. So then to supply it, I have to bridge again. So now I'm paying another 0.25. So that's 50, uh, half an XRP. And then I was like, okay, so this doesn't make much sense. I'm paying 15% interest to get 12% like why would I do that so when I withdraw I receive 148.69 uh, USDC so from 150 I paid almost 140 or 130 to, to just to bridge and then when I did this you will see that I paid yeah and then so I withdrew and I, I, it cost me USDC at that point. And then when I bridge back from US, from XRP Ledger in, to pay my back my loan, I paid another 25 XRP or 0.25 XRP. So, that, and that's kind of the point uh, that I want to make. It's like Flare, once it did that, once you bridge your, your XRP to Flare, you're on Flare. Like you don't have to be bridging back and forth. Uh, I feel like... I don't know if this is a axular limitation or the EBM side uh, limitation. It's a very new chain and there's still stuff that needs to happen. So hopefully that's going to change. But like I said, the more that I learn about Flare, the more that I realize the power of doing so. The root network had the same issue. You are like, oh, you're in a EBM side chain, 
But then when you pay gas on, on Flare, you're paying 3 XRP. I remember the first time that I did it, I think I paid 3 XRP for one operation. So what's the point of using XRP if you're going to be paying fees as if you were in Ethereum? So that's my opinion on that. So how does Flare stand out from the other interoperability solutions? If you're not convinced, let's talk about this. It's a non-invasive integration. Uh, you don't have to change the protocols or implement new features on the other blockchains. Flare adapts to you, not the other way around. It focuses on non-smart contract chains. So there's a lot of bridges and a lot of options for uh, BNB and SUI and BASE and e uh, Ethereum. But for non-smart contracts, there's very few. So some chains wrap your XRP, but that has a centralized bridge risk. And they're usually multi-six. And we know that multi-six fail all the time um, and then the other option is for example coinbase products where you deposit your bitcoin or your xrp on coinbase and then they give you a coinbase bitcoin or a coinbase xrp so if you're okay with being in a exchange then by all means but in my opinion this is like the next level of that um, it has the decentralized oracle solution which we have talked plenty about it and then it's a developer friendly environment. So it supports multiple programming languages. It's built on the Ethereum virtual machine. So that means that bringing stuff from, I mean, like Strove could launch on Flare pretty easily if they wanted to. So let's talk about uh, the, I don't want to talk, uh, I don't want to recommend you to invest or not invest. That's up to you. But I want to talk about like what's the strengths and then also what are the considerations. It solves a real problem. It has functioning technology, not just promises. So Strobe, and like I said, I'm not shit talking about them. They, the EBM sidechain just launched. So that means that there's a lot of limitations on that. Like the borrowing and lending, they have to, bo they have to grow their liquidity. In Flare, we have been doing that for over a year. So the moment that FXRP launches on Flare, they already have a fully liquid market where you can start transacting, you can lend, you can borrow, you can do all of these things. So sure, I, I'm, I believe that at the beginning they're going to cap it and they're going to grow grow it in a responsible way. But like you already have a functioning network on Flare. They already have strong partnerships. Uh, I haven't heard much about the Ripple connection directly, but I have heard about it. There are some Nasdaq companies that they have promised to deposit XRP and put it to work. Uh, the TBL has grown insane in the last six months. So it's just growing developer ecosystem. A lot of people are joining because they see the power of this. And then things to consider, there is competing interoperability solutions. So this is the Axelar bridge and this is a competition. Maybe if you were doing like much bigger operations, then this wouldn't be so much of an issue. But the, the reality is that there are interoperability solutions that already exist. So that's one of the things. Uh, ultimately, if nobody uses Flare, then no matter how good the technology is, we know how the beta and BHS thing went. Uh, beta was a better technology, but BHS won. So that's something really to consider. There is certain uh, regulatory uncertainty there's regulatory uncertainty around cross-chain solutions. And then, of course, the market volatility affects all of crypto projects. So I think Flare is the early days. And it's insane that the Flare drops are going to end early next year. So we have been doing Flare drop for 30 months. I've been getting at the beginning, I think it was around 5%. Now we're around 2% per month just by holding and wrapping your Flare. It's insane. All right, guys, I think this has been a pretty long video, so I hope you enjoy it and I will see you 